Charles knowing. All right, man. Welcome to Crow Triple Seven Radio. This is episode 243. Jason Lindgren and I alone today. Uh, we're going to go through the history of corporations. In a lot of ways, corporation is an illusion. It is a thing that exists in our imagination, which means everything that has to do with it, for the most part, is imaginary. The rules that bind it, the on and on and on. So as we get in, you're going to see, I don't know, Jason will define it better, 1400s, 1600s, maybe by the time it's really becoming a thing. This precedes the ability of news that isn't accurate or other things to sway the way a mind thinks. But nonetheless, it is a system. And when people begin to interact with the system, they would say things like, oh, well, the East India Company owns this. Well, no, they don't. The East India Company doesn't exist. It can't own anything. It's an idea. It's an imagined name of a thing that has no life. So anyhow, welcome, Jason. Well, it's the end of a very hot Louisiana morning. Rose and I just came back from the farmer's market. And, you know, even way back when, these early corporations, the big ones, as you just mentioned, were acting kind of like how they do today, almost like their countries where they're laying claim to things. And it just shows you that they were doing this nonsense pff, however long ago, hundreds of years ago. It's not always obvious to me when we look at these things to what degree the supposed crowns uh, were in control and to what degree the actual corporations. At a certain point, it becomes clear that they were being directed, but they were, in fact, the colonization mechanism, whereas most people would think of it, oh, a government or a crown or someone has an army, we go in and colonize this place. Canada is case in point. Uh, a version of the East India Company up into Canada there. I don't know if that made it into our notes, but uh, where do you want to jump in here? Well, let's get the basics out of the way. A corporation is an organization, usually a group of people or a company, authorized by the state to act as a single entity, a legal entity, a legal person in legal context, and recognized as such in law for certain purposes. Early incorporated entities were established by charter, for example, by an ad hoc act granted by a monarch or passed by a parliament or legislature. Most jurisdictions now allow the creation of new corporations through registration. Corporations come in many different types, but are usually divided by the law of the jurisdiction where they are chartered based on two aspects, by whether they can issue stock or by whether they are formed to make a profit. Depending on the number of owners, a corporation can be classified as aggregate or sole. So this is kind of a stripped down version of what we're talking about. But, you know, when we get into these things, it's really where words have meaning. And here's the case in point about the illusion. We can say oh, it was an ad hoc grant. Um, we can say a charter, and most people think they know what these things means, but if you take a closer look at the meanings of those words, you'd be surprised at how much more information is jammed into these ideas. And as a matter of fact, uh, there's a few books out that show how currency in the United States came to be. Uh, it used to be backed by specie, or basically gold and silver. And when that began to change, there were charters and grants um, and the federal government could have made its own money, but then all these states started printing their own currency and it became quite a quagmire. But the point I'm making is when you're thinking about these things and someone says the word grant, someone says the word chartered, do you actually know what's being expressed there? I would suggest that most of us do not. And this too feeds into the imagination game. Most of what we are going to be discussing are what are called corporation aggregates. However, there is a need to mention the other type of corporation as well. A corporation sole, which is spelled S-O-L-E, is a legal entity consisting of a single or a sole incorporated office occupied by a single or sole natural person. This structure allows corporations, often religious corporations or commonwealth governments, to pass without interruption from one office holder to the next giving positions legal continuity with subsequent office holders having identical powers and possessions to their predecessors. There are many notable corporation souls, such as those in monarchies and religious organizations, both large and small. 
do we stop and think about how the older ideas that we cover so often, like the alchemical philosophical principles, uh, how they are the foundation for this? So we're saying soul, we're spelling it S-O-L-E. Everybody knows that pretty much an individual is the idea behind it, but nonetheless, it is a soul, isn't it? It is a single soul. It's almost like saying that ship went down, how many souls were lost? Sounds like, often is like, and in this case, it's true. As we go through these definitions, you could almost be thinking, well, when did the spirit and the salt come into this conversation? Um, these ideas began to move away from what was naturally observable in a natural world with, uh, for lack of better terms, legal fictions, maybe something like that, Jason. Yeah. Even way back when we start seeing paperwork taking the place of reality. Well, that there it is. You, you know, you, you've hit that massive nail square on the head. All of a sudden there's this document, which all these things are going to be done to the document. And then people are going to be coerced into becoming responsible for the document. We've covered that ad nauseum at this point. And the interesting thing far back in time, there wasn't this offset of technological capability where one group could massively take over another group because their technology is so much better. The only thing they would have had, honestly, would have been numbers. Sure, they might have had better swords and bows and things like that. But for the most part, if a group of people wanted to really stand up to an organization of some sort, well, as long as they had the numbers, they could do it, right? It's unfortunately not something you see today. So if you, someone wants to stand up to a corporation, let's say, the technological capability that's going to come at you is far, far different than it would have been hundreds of years ago. And it gives them this massive distinct advantage that <laughs> it gives them the capability to take advantage of, of whatever and just abuse the system as they see fit. Right. And that's the idea of piercing the veil of corporation. So if you're just a human being running some kind of a business, you probably care about your customers. You probably do what you can to make them happy. When you get into the idea of corporation, part of it is you can't sue an individual anymore unless they break the rules of corporation, allowing you to pierce the corporate veil, which as far as I can tell is a pretty rare thing. Um, but it also is some of the earliest claims for just openly bad behavior. Take the East India Company going into China with the whole opium thing. It is claimed, uh, and this is from a mainstream timeline, that as all these drugs, opium, were being pushed into China, that the emperor of China writes a note to the monarch of England and says, aren't you ashamed of yourself? You're turning my country into drug addicts as if there was still that level of naive in the world. The point being is they were openly saying, we're going to, you know, not only are we coming in by force, uh, we're going to drug out your nation. There's not a damn thing you can do about it because we have the Navy. Uh, so you see the bad behavior beca becoming public record at whatever level it's actually legitimate. Hard to know. And the British did the same damned thing with India, and that lasted all the way into the 20th century. Even as they walked out the door, the deck was stacked behind them, I would point out. A corporation is a legally distinct entity that has many of the rights attributed to individuals. These rights include the ability to enter into contracts, take out loans, sue others, be sued, own assets, pay taxes, and so on. A corporation is formed when individuals exchange consideration that is usually in the form of cash for shares of the corporation, which in turn creates a right to a portion of profits. Generally, the losses incurred by a shareholder of a corporation are limited to the amount invested. This is a concept known as limited liability. You will see this today after certain businesses as LLC. Limited liability allows individuals to avoid personal liability for a business entity's losses, thereby allowing risk-averse individuals to assume risks they otherwise might not otherwise undertake. Corporations also allow individuals to pool resources to achieve goals that would be unattainable by a person acting in an individual capacity and can last longer than an individual's lifetime. The benefits of the corporate form can also, of course, create opportunities for abuse. And this is the modern era. It really is. You know, uh, I would say, you know, the early days of YouTube, there was still an idea that free speech in the United States was a thing that couldn't be messed with. Uh, what happened is corporations, mighty, huge, massive corporations, began to provide public forums, which they openly called public forums at that time, which made them, by that definition, have to heal 
under the ideas of free speech because they were a public forum. But then they began to abridge people's free speech, remove it, control it. Um, and so this is case in point for the abuse. So when people started to go back to look at what they thought they knew about free speech, they found, oh, the government cannot infringe. And, you know, it was basically these ideas and the corporation is not a government. But ironically, the government is a corporation. So you can see how the abuse has crept in everywhere to the point where when I was looking up ideas about free speech, uh, I found cases from the highest court where a corporation could openly abridge the free speech because they were a corporation, because an employee was working for the corporation, therefore basically rendering unto Caesar because they are working for the system. And the corporation could say, you're on my time clock. You can't talk about this. And of course, that was upheld in the higher courts. But by the time we get to things like YouTube, um, this started as an open public forum. Over time, the way that's been defined or tried to be portrayed has moved far from these ideas to a corporate idea where we're here to make money. This is not a public forum. You're using our system. And what has followed from then till now is the outright control of what can be talked about. The word corporation derives from corpus, the Latin word for body or a body of people. By the time of Justinian, who reigned from 527 until 565 AD, Roman law recognized a range of corporate entities under the names universitas, corpus, or collegium, or collegia. Cities were the first entities that the Romans treated as corporations. Over time, the concept was extended to certain community organizations and started to be called collegia. It would come to include the Roman state itself, called the Populus Romanus, as well as municipalities and such private associations as sponsors of a religious cult, burial clubs, political groups, and guilds of craftsmen or traders. Such bodies commonly had the right to own property and make contracts, to receive gifts and legacies, to sue and be sued, and in general, to perform legal acts through representatives. Private associations were granted designated privileges and liberties by the emperor. Entities which carried on business and were the subjects of legal rights were found in ancient Rome as well as in the Maurya Empire in ancient India. So here it is, you know, all the way back in what we all view as an ancient time, whenever it actually was and how it actually was. Uh, the idea that this city is owned and operated, but it's not a family per se or the emperor per se. It's this corporation, which really shifts the way you think about things. But think about this one thing. He began to talk about the traders' guilds, craftsmen's guilds. In our current world, this has become a very reduced thing. It doesn't exist in the same way it used to. But even in that, there was this idea of holding up standards uh, and quality and how you conducted yourself so to speak. And these have fallen off. But what he included there was some of these trade unions, guilds, craftsmen, political groups. They had the right to own property in a way that is a bit like saying they were entitled at a certain level, which you and I are not currently in the way things have come. The Roman Republic relied on private contractors to perform a variety of tasks. Contracts to build aqueducts, manufacture arms, construct temples, collect taxes, and even feeding the geese on the capital, all were granted to firms called publicane. These originated as loose associations among contractors who would pool their resources to bid on contracts. Over time, the publicani evolved into permanent companies with numerous investors, only a handful of whom served as managers. Larger publicane employed thousands of workers spread across Rome's provinces. Fragmented historical evidence indicates that some of these received corporate status, habere corpus, which included a grant of limited liability for investors. The publicani were well-connected and, at times, would have been extremely influential. Collusion with government officials was a lucrative way of business. If there was public indignation, it was balanced by investment enthusiasm. <laughs> so what are we saying here now? The imagination has become so grand. 
Uh, we can make money from feeding the ducks through corporation, basically. Um, it, it starts to change the world entirely if you try to remove your mind back to a time when there were human beings living on the land and there wasn't a sense that somebody owned all the land. Once we get up to this time, something altogether different is going on. Now an imaginary entity owns or controls all this. And by the way, everything we're hearing, he doing here is for profit. And so I made the joke of feeding the ducks because he pointed out that there was independent contractors who were bidding to feed the geese. Well, why would you be bidding to feed the geese? Is it that you love the geese or is it that there is a profit somehow to be made? Why else would you bid to feed the geese? You see. And just a quote here about the Roman situation by the Greek historian Polybius and how much this sounds like today. He lived during the Hellenistic period and he reported that, quote, there is scarcely a soul, one might say, who does not have some interest in these contracts and the profits which are derived from them. So think of the words that were just laid down here. He used the word soul and he spelled it as if living men and women had a concern, S-O-U-L. Now, how many ways can we spell that word? Well, we could talk about the sun and spell it S-O-L. We could talk about the individual and we could spell it S-O-L-E. It goes on and on. There are a number of fashionings of this idea and this word, but this man here is poking you in the eye, isn't he? He's saying there's this imaginative thing that's been created that has no life, but all these souls, S-O-U-L, are benefiting from them, if you follow. Early notions of limited liability. The corporate form emerged from economic arrangements that mirrored the concept of limited liability offered by modern corporations. One such arrangement was the commenda, a system developed in 11th century Italy, wherein a passive partner provided funding for a merchant vessel to be sailed by a managing partner who invested no capital. Upon completion of the voyage, the partners divided up the profits under a predetermined formula. This arrangement allowed the passive partner to limit his or her liability of their investment, while the managing partner assumed the risks associated with the cargo and the voyage. Soon, investors began pooling their funds to diminish the risk of losing their entire fortune on a single voyage. In doing so, the investors realized the benefits of pairing limited liability with diversification. So in this paragraph, if you break it down carefully and think about what's being said, there's this one partner who's going to manage the vessel who didn't put up any cash because he probably didn't have cash to put up. Um, but what's going to happen is, is if he successfully manages the cargo to where it's going, he gets a cut of the profit. But let's break that down for a second. Prior to these kinds of fictitious ideas, um, people would do things because it needed to be done or because there would be gain in some way. Now what's going on is there's a fictitious entity that has cargo or goods or whatever, and the rich people who are controlling it and funding it and doing all these things are putting an action in motion, and then a man who has no interest in anything going on participates for the simple reason that he can get paid at the end of it. So the idea that we're doing these things because it's important or they need to be done or society depends on it is out the window. Now what's beginning to happen with corporations is this dude with all this money set all this stuff into motion. And since I'd like to have money, I'm going to contribute to whatever the hell he wanted done. If you logically break down the difference between a world derived from some natural existing idea to how this is actually working. This is an early example of people with money wanting to make more money, but not wanting to do actually any work. They just put their money and let someone else do it. Yeah, the argument will always be, and I could probably imagine the comments coming already, is the managing partner who didn't have money, who did this, doesn't give a damn about what his cargo is or anything else. He just wants a paycheck. If he succeeds at it, now he's, you know, he can feed his kids and all that. And so, I, you know, I'm not totally downing everything here. Clearly, people got to live. I'm just pointing out, this is how you don't just run from nature, this is how you get on a high-speed bullet train eventually and haul butt from nature. Um, and people forget because we're so bought into these systems, but these systems are so detached from the realities of a natural world. 
In medieval Europe, churches, cities, guilds, and monasteries all became incorporated, as did local governments and such entities as the Pope and the City of London Corporation. The point was that the incorporation would survive longer than the lives of any particular member existing in perpetuity. The alleged oldest commercial corporation in the world, the Stora Copperberg Mining Community in Falun, Sweden, obtained a charter from King Magnus Ericsson in the year 1347. In medieval times, traders would do business through common law constructs such as partnerships. Whenever people acted together with a view to profit, the law deemed that a partnership arose. Early guilds and livery companies were also often involved in the regulation of competition between traders. When we think of these things now, it's almost like we can't imagine anything going a different way. But let's back up a little bit and I'll make a couple points. Um, you know, you pointed out that in supposed medieval times, whenever that imaginary period was, Europe, churches, cities, guilds, monasteries, they're all incorporated. There's a time not too far before that where the idea of a church was spiritual concerns and the idea of money or other things. It was tied wholly to nature. Um, they were making their own stuff with nature, interacting with nature, and traveling a much more spiritual path. The moment that incorporation comes, now there's shareholders. Now there's other people who have concerns. Now the, the head holy man of the church is probably going to be held responsible for the balance sheet. So if you follow what I'm laying down here, you can see how even the intrinsic nature of a thing that seeks to do a positive thing is being changed simply from the systems that are functioning. But I'll ask a simple question. Is there any other entities in the world besides the Pope and the city of London who have had a more drastic effect on the life of every living man and woman that you can bump into on the streets today? I would suggest that there's not. And why is this? This is because of corporation. This is because of profit. This is because of the ability to turn human beings into chattel. This is the idea of equity. This is the idea of beneficiaries, if you follow what I'm laying down here. And I'll ask openly, if someone can come up with something that has more vastly affected the lives of damn near everyone, more than the Vatican or the Pope, and the city of London, I would be interested to consider those ideas because as I sit here thinking about it, I can't imagine a farther reach or a more drastic effect on the world than these two, wait for it, corporations have had. Moving along through time, we come to colonial companies. Only in the 17th century did making money become a major focus for corporations. Their wealth was used to finance European colonial expansion. Companies were used by the various imperial powers to maintain draconian control of trade, resources, and territory in Asia, Africa, and the Americas. So there it is, man. Bad behavior coming out of these fictitious legal ideas, partnerships, and beneficiaries, and corporation, and the rights of a person, and all these fictions uh, that we all agree to. Uh, this is what's going on. Can, can we show very many examples in our world where your European colonialization was a positive thing? Uh, I'm sure there were people who would make the argument, but I would make the argument how much ancient knowledge got lost every time one of those old places about to be colonized was taken over. Oh, guess what? You don't speak your language anymore. Oh, guess what? Here's your new religion. Oh, guess what? All these ways you used to understand nature, that's all out the window now, because guess what? The East India Trading Company is here, and we got everything you need. By the way, would you like some opium? If you see the kind of one-sided ideas that I'm laying down. My point being is, does colonization as we recognize it happen to at all? without corporation in the way we recognize it. And I would suggest that it doesn't. And early on, I mean, we're talking the 1600s here, um, it's almost like East India Company and these other basically pirate corporations sanctioned by a crown somewhere are in our world for two reasons. To make a crap load of, well, actually three reasons. To make a crap load of money, to corner and control the market that's making their money, and then to subjugate and basically own and operate the place where those goods and services they're interested in exist called colonization. Um, it's a hell of a thing. And for my part, uh, I'm not down with it. I'm more interested in the natural ideas. There's this idea in the world 
that every human being has a choice. You can go on what's called the left-hand path or the right-hand path. And in the way it's described, it's basically if you turn left, you're going with Darth Vader to use the common analogy. And if you make a right, you're going to be angelic. Okay, those are the very extreme analogies. And there is, here's the thing, in nature, there is no violation in turning left. Apparently, from everything I've studied, it is everyone's choice whether you want to operate by the dark of night or whether you want to operate by the light of day. And by the way, the natural world provides both of those environments for you to operate, proving that there is no violation. But for my part, these are all corporations that have affected world history more than any other thing I can imagine, and they're all operating by the dark of night, mostly. To put this most simply, when you have these sorts of things going on, this consolidation of power, you have given the capability, you're allowing the capability of the few to subjugate the many. Right. And you're doing another thing to take that extension a little more is you're removing even the possibility that the concerns of a living man or living woman will have any equal weight in a conversation. Because after all, there are shareholders and boards of directors saying, you damn well better give me the profit that I think I have coming or you'll be gone tomorrow and we'll have a new sea captain. We'll have a new brigadier general. Um, so then that is really when you see the violation of the concerns of living men and women take uh, the low side of the scale um, because of that pressure exerted. And what's exerting the pressure? Well, the corporate idea is and the profit idea is subjugating the godly concerns of life for profit. And by the way, assigning every living thing, every piece of dirt, every scrap of this creation that we call nature a monetary value, basically, and not just a monetary value, but who, who, who supposedly owns it. And I would contend that nobody owns it. You're borrowing it at best. You're using it maybe under force, but it ain't yours. And by the way, you can't take it with you. To put this in a modern context, how many people have been affected by a corporation in their personal lives, even to the point that the needs of the corporation have been completely put over the needs of the natural living person. Great example. Sorry, we have to let you go. The corporation just can't keep you anymore. I, I can give another example that resonates with almost everything. Is there anything worse than having to pick up the damn telephone and talk to your insurance company? That corporation, that interaction is one of the most frustrating, maddening things you will ever have to do, particularly, wait for it, if you have to make a claim because you accepted the offer, just to put the language around it that gets everybody in the correct frame of mind. And this, this can be broken down further too. Do you have the choice not to have auto insurance? After all, in this day and age, was not always this way. When you get your auto insurance, almost always now at the top, it says, here's the offer. Informing you flat out, this is an offer. Anytime an offer is made, it means that you don't have to accept the offer. There is a way you have to not accept the offer without negative language. You can't say no or I don't want to, but we've covered these ideas. The point being is it feels like you have to accept this offer. So how is that an offer in the first place? And that's because corporation leveraging its might against the concerns of living man or woman. But I'll ask flat out, has anybody listening to this had to deal on the subject of a claim with their insurance company where they can say it was a joy? Or was it a bit like pulling needles out of your eyeballs? Just asking. Well, of course, it's a law to have auto insurance. That's one great big corporation making sure that its resources are protected in every way, shape, and form. That means you, your corporate identity, whether you get injured or another corporate identity gets injured, the money is always taken care of somewhere. Well, this is the idea of the absolute factual, logical reality of our world being thrown aside. So if I get my auto insurance and it says this is an offer, how the hell can there be a law saying that I have to do this because that would mean it's not an offer? It's just another example of a double reverse that throws logic or the concerns of a living human being out the window. You're writing this as an offer. An offer can be turned down. 
if there's a law saying I have to accept that offer, then that also tells you what corporations have done because your local municipality is actually a corporation. So when you see a statute, it's actually a policy and it's almost like the biblical render unto Caesar. What is Caesar's? If you're going to use these corporate systems, then to some degree, you're going to be bound by things that should have no bearing on the life of a living man or woman. And that that one little idea there is the overbearing reality of the power and reach of corporation in the modern age. Development of joint stock companies. In the 1600s, the British crown began granting monopolies to groups of investors willing to undertake certain ventures. These monopolies took the form of joint stock companies that allowed labor and capital to be aggregated for the purpose of undertaking tasks that would be too large for any one person. A famous example was that of the East India Company, in which investors pooled capital into a single joint stock company from which profits would be distributed according to capital invested. Only members of the East India Company had the privilege of conducting trade with India. The East India Company eventually came to form a government over large portions of India and maintaining a standing army. <laughs> it's like Google with an army, man. Um, this, this one thing, when you start to look at things like what happened with the East India Company, it pre-echoes where we have come. It's almost like at some point back when these corporations started to get so big and have so much power that they were basically colonizing complete continents, uh, somebody said, hmm, I wonder if we could monopolize a corporation to the point where we could take over the whole world. Well, maybe we'll just have to wait to 2020 to see. Hint, hint, hint. Well, this is the example of what I said earlier. This is the few being given the capability to subjugate the many. There weren't enough British people going to India to take over the whole continent, but they were given the capability to do so piece by piece. Right. And then there's also the, the idea that you're shown that it backfired, that in fact there were too many Indians there for them to control it any longer. Um, of course, history is a lie agreed upon because the history we get is always one-sided, isn't it? It's from the people who came out on top in some way. Uh, but here's the thing, and I use it all the time. What was it, the 70s or whenever they broke up the, the phone system, what we used to call Ma Bell? There's still the idea all the way to the modern era that monopoly is bad. What was the antitrust suit against Microsoft with Internet Explorer coming in and monopolizing the browser. To this day, the idea of monopoly is bad. But what's actually going on is we're being made to perceive this one truth while the exact opposite is being implemented as quickly as a bullet train or a jet can travel. Because that's, in fact, what's going on in our world is monopoly on a level that we've never seen. So the, the question becomes, when you know that the European Union came to be a thing, by the way, does anyone vote? For the things that are done by the European Union to the people of Europe? I don't know. I don't live there. I'm asking a question, kind of a blunt question for a reason. But my point being, when we come out the other side of this kind of dust cloud we're all existing in right now, do these things get addressed? I would suggest that we have to be entering a time where the end of corporation is going to be evident. Now, does this happen now or 100 years? I don't know. But I would suggest that as the sky clock turns and human consciousness rises, that legal fiction cannot hold as prominent a place in a sane world. It just can't. Because we all have to imagine every piece of this for the systems to work. In the same way we have to imagine that when I hand you a dollar, I've handed you something of value. We all know there's no value there. We all know it's paper. We all know that it's basically an IOU that will never get paid because you will take that dollar and hand it to someone else, expecting that they will accept it because they too can hand it off to someone else. But all that's coming to an end now, isn't it? That system is failing. And I would suggest that the Googles or the Amazons of the world have reached a size that has never been conceived uh, and the wealth and power and control of living men and women is overwhelming at this point. So what I'm suggesting is that if living men and women are in an upward cycle and we're going to lift, the idea of corporation has to diminish and eventually go away. 
Uh, is that wishful thinking or is that logically where we have to go? I'm just asking. And just to let everybody know, the breakup of Ma Bell was started in 1974 with the paperwork, but wasn't mandated until 1982. And there's an important point there, because what happened was Ma Bell, as we called it, the telephone system, was viewed as one of the biggest, most powerful things. If you had stock in Ma Bell, that was a hell of a stock to have. But it it was a monopoly. And everybody knew it was a monopoly until all of a sudden, oh, this is a monopoly and monopolies are bad. So Ma Bell, you got to break up into all these smaller telecoms. And by the way, you don't own all that infrastructure, all those wires and telephone poles. You, you got to let everybody share because monopolies are bad. But you can see the double reverse that always comes. Because right now, we are with every time you see T-Mobile and whoever the hell they just merged with, what you're seeing is the consolidation down to that one magical Taco Bell, <laughs> the one corporation that made it, the one corporation that basically enveloped everything else. That's where we're kind of heading in the one world idea. But will we get there? I don't know, but I would suggest for human consciousness to be rising as we see it is, these ideas have to start to diminish and go away. That would be T-Mobile and Sprint coming together with AT&T still being by itself. (laughs) Wasn't AT&T the official name? I don't even remember. Was that actually Ma Bell? Was actually AT&T or something like that? Yes. The East India Company, or EIC, also known as the Honorable East India Company, East India Trading Company, the English East India Company, or the British East India Company, and informally known as John Company, Company Bahador, or simply The Company, (laughs) was an English and later British joint stock company. It was formed to trade in the Indian Ocean region, initially with the East Indias, India and Southeast Asia, and later with King China. The company ended up seizing control of large parts of the Indian subcontinent, colonized parts of Southeast Asia and Hong Kong after the First Opium War, and maintained trading posts and colonies in the Middle Eastern Gulf called Persian Gulf Residencies. Originally chartered as the governor and company of merchants of London trading into the East Indies, the company rose to account for half of the world's trade, particularly in basic commodities, including cotton, silk, indigo dye, salt, spices, saltpeter, tea, and, of course, opium. The company also ruled the beginnings of the British Empire in India. In his speech to the House of Commons in July of 1833, Lord Macaulay explained that since the beginning, the East India Company had always been involved in both trade and politics, just as its French and Dutch counterparts had been. The company received a royal charter from Queen Elizabeth I on December 31st, 1600, coming relatively late to trade in the Indies. Before them, the Portuguese Estado da India had traded there for much of the 16th century, and the first of half a dozen Dutch companies sailed to trade there from 1595. These Dutch companies amalgamated in March of 1602 into the Dutch East India Company, or VOC, which introduced the first permanent joint stock from 1612, meaning investment into shares did not need to be returned, but could be traded on a stock exchange. By contrast, wealthy merchants and aristocrats owned the EIC's shares. Initially, the government owned no shares and had only indirect control until 1657 when permanent joint stock was established. Man, I'll just make a couple points. There's so much here we could finish out a half hour on this paragraph alone. First of all, for those people interested in fiction reading, uh, one of my favorite fiction authors when I was younger, not so much now, was James Clavell, the guy who wrote Shogun. But that whole series of books, Noble House, Shogun, The Whirlwind, brings it up into the Middle East. But those early ones, Taipan, Shogun, um, Noble House, these books are all about Asia and what the East India Company did there. And the opium in China all the way up to Hong Kong. So now, if you read those fictionalized accounts of basically a fictionalized bunch of characters playing in for what the East India Company did, you begin to understand how Hong Kong came to be. 
And then you begin to understand something about what happened. What was it, 99, I think, something like that, when supposedly Britain handed Hong Kong back to China. And this is all on the back of corporation. But it worked so well in Asia. This is the story of the Middle East as the book Whirlwind carries past Hong Kong to take you in to show how the Middle East was founded by the very same corporations. And of course, if you were alive in that part of the world back then and you were in opium, you were low. You had to be hiding, you had, but not the East India Company, brothers and sisters. Yeah, there's tea on board and opium too. Anyone got a problem with it? A bit like the pharmaceuticals today. But let's come back around. There are older examples, we are told, than the East India Company, and I don't know how we ever ignore the reach, power, and influence to this day of those Dutch families that set that stuff up. And here's an example of why. In Japan, and this is a lesson, by the way, and this is a lesson that I've wrestled with my whole life. You look at a place like Tibet. How was it that Tibet supposedly had the spiritual concerns of every living being in the world as its paramount concern for existing, and they were knocked over so easily. Well, here's the lesson. Uh, we had great relations with Tibet and stat, sat on our asses right here and watched China mow them down. That's literally what happened. So is it possible for a country to exist and say, hey, man, we are interested in spiritual concerns? We are interested in the benefit of all living beings and still be able to exist. I would suggest to you it is not possible in a world of corporation. And here's the lesson. The Dutch companies, very few know, were in Japan long after everyone was kicked out of Japan. There was this one little island where almost all Dutch companies were allowed to exist and China was or Japan was never wholly separated from the outside world because those Dutch remained and they were the key pathway into what was going on in Japan. So you might ask, and I've asked it a lot of times, how the hell come Japan was always included in the top tier of power players in the world? How come they were never mowed down? And I think the story is right here. In the same way Tibet was mowed down is because they didn't have anyone tough standing on their street corners. When the Portuguese and the Spanish and all those other people came into Japan, they had one thing on their mind. To do to Japan what they'd done to all these other places. Act like we're here to trade and then kick the living crap out of them and own and operate them at their leisure. What actually happened was Japan had a samurai class and those dudes would die at a moment's notice if that's what it took to stand up. And that is what saved Japan as far as I can tell. To the point where the emperor said, everyone get the hell out. We're closing down for a couple hundred years. But they didn't. The Dutch companies were always there. And what was the Dutch companies? The operating template that the later East India Company would match. After all, it is claimed the East India Company is actually late to the game. It just doesn't seem like that when we look back now, because the East India Company basically started to own everything that mattered at certain points. Look at the version of the East India Company that goes into Canada. Is it called? Uh, I think it's named after a river god. I can't recall it. There's actually a blanket type that holds the name. I just can't think of it, but it's basically a version of the East India Company. I think it's the Hudson in Canada acting as the government early on. The Dutch East India Company, officially the United East India Company, or the VOC, was a mega corporation founded by a government-directed amalgamation of several rival Dutch trading companies in the early 17th century. It was established on March 20th, 1602, as a chartered company to trade with Mughal India during the period of proto-industrialization. At this time, 50% of textiles and 80% of silks were imported, chiefly from its most developed region known as Bengal Suba. In addition, the company traded with Indianized Southeast Asian countries when the Dutch government granted it a 21-year monopoly on the Dutch spice trade. It has been often labeled a trading company, a company of merchants who buy and sell goods produced by other people, or sometimes a shipping company. However, the VOC was in fact a proto-conglomerate diversifying into multiple commercial and industrial activities, such as international trade, especially intra-Asian trade, shipbuilding, and both production and trade of East Indian spices, Indonesian coffee, Formosan sugarcane, and South African wine. 
The company was a transcontinental employer and a corporate pioneer of outward foreign direct investment at the dawn of modern capitalism. In the early 1600s, by widely issuing bonds and shares of stock to the general public, VOC became the world's first formally listed public company. With its pioneering institutional innovations and powerful roles in global business history, the company is often considered by many to be the forerunner of modern corporations. In many respects, modern day corporations are all the direct descendants of the VOC model. It was its 17th century institutional innovations and business practices that laid the foundations for the rise of giant worldwide corporations in subsequent centuries as a highly significant and formidable socio-political economic force of the modern day world to become the dominant factor in almost all economic systems today. It also served as the direct model for the organizational reconstruction of the English-British East India Company in 1657. The company, for nearly 200 years of its existence, from 1602 to 1800, had effectively transformed itself from a corporate entity into a state or an empire in its own right. One of the most influential and best expertly researched business enterprises in history, the VOC's world has been the subject of a vast amount of literature that includes both fiction and nonfiction works. All right. Well, if the mainstream timeline is anything uh, that we can view without a bucket of salt so we could take pinches at a time, you would imagine by the year 1800, people were asking, why do we need a crown or a government? Uh, we got these corporations, which, which basically run the world, right? I mean, you got to imagine that was the case. And that's also probably why they were brought to heel. But uh, so many people forget when they think about the East India Company, about the Dutch concerns. It's almost like those brothers ran undercover uh, in world history. And I think that has to do with the bloodlines they came from. After all, when you start pointing out that basically we're doing trade and we're building ships, but at some point you're a transcontinental employer, a colonization facilitator, a corporate pioneer, and you own and operate via monopoly the only systems of trade that matter in a worldwide perspective, you've become something else, haven't you? And I would suggest to you that in the age of information, there are companies like Google or Amazon, which are the new versions of the East India Company. Uh, there's really no difference except for the technology of the time. Instead of sailing ships, there's an Ethernet cable, basically. And the last point for hour one, another notable joint stock company was the Virginia Company, which helped expand British control of North America. The Virginia Company established the General Assembly, which was the first legislature in North America. Examples such as this demonstrate that by allowing the aggregation of resources, corporations can be organized to carry out tasks that are too big for one person or perhaps even one government. And I might also add that it shows how corporation is directly involved and having a controlling interest in government. Or vice versa, and it's never been any different uh, to the point of the story in East India when you get up to the 1800s, the story they want us to accept is that they stepped in and made it heal to the idea of parliament or crown or whatever. But I, I should have looked up before we said, I didn't realize that we were going to end up talking about Canada at all. So for the people of the Great White North up there in Canada, if I've messed up the name of the corporation, I think it's Hudson something, but I just can't recall. And I don't have time to look it up right now. Down in the United States, we have the Virginia Company. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of obliquely aware of what's gone on in Canada to a different degree, although I have read a couple books on it. And it's the same story over and over. I think what you're looking for is the Hudson's Bay Company. Yeah. See, there's the reason I, I even remember this is there's these blankets and they have like a, a off-white color to them. And if I'm not mistaken, it's red, black, and yellow stripe. And you'll see it like in old movies like maybe Jeremiah Johnson or something where they're trying to be authentic. Um, these Hudson Bay Blankets. Now, when I was on the East Coast as a kid, these things were around, and that is an echo of what we're talking about, and apparently those were traded with the natives, but I'm getting way off topic here. When we come to the Virginia Company, what we're talking about when you begin to research it is fascinating, and I've got all these things in my head. Problem is, is I'd be guessing right now, like I almost want to recite 
the state bird of Virginia as uh, the great horned owl. But I don't know if I'm right. I think I'm right, but I got to look to know something Bubo. How many people remember uh, Clash of the Titans, the original, right? That's Bubo. Well, now you know where those names are derived from. But these corporations fashioned the modern world. And there came a point where we didn't really realize, I think, to what degree corporation fashioned our world, even when automobiles were the be all and end all from like the, you know, the 50s forward, where all of a sudden everyone was going to be mobile in the United States because of all these great cars. Well, there was a corporate center for that called Detroit. And there used to be a saying in this country, which is ironic because it did not take people long to forget that what was good for Detroit was good for the, the country. And then, of course, in the 80s, the Iacocca, that we're going to dismantle this place all of a sudden. When it used to be a decade earlier, what was good for Detroit was good for the United States. All of a sudden, everyone was convinced, up, oh, this just doesn't work on the global market anymore, and we got to rip it all down. And look what happened. The heartbeat, because of corporation, was ripped out of our country without so much as a how do you do to the very people that made it all possible. And when you look at these things, you've got to imagine that if the path of human beings is going to rise, I will say it again, corporation as we now recognize it has to begin to be diminished. And again, does it happen? Does it happen in 50 years? Does it happen in 100? Does it happen after we go by the next year marker? I don't know. But for us to rise, these fictitious, unnatural ideas would have to diminish. Anything you want to add, Jason? Well, what you're describing there is the needs of the company being put over the needs of the people, the natural people who are part of the company or were part of the company because they can make more profits by using overseas labor where they can get away with a lot less for any of that. And, well, we see the results of it, don't we? Look at Detroit today. Well, not just Detroit. Look out your window. If you want the most extreme example of what corporation represents, guess what? You might not be safe. You can't go to work anymore. By the way, you can't go to school anymore. By the way, nobody exactly knows what's happened to all your money in a place called the central bank anymore, all brought to you via corporation and media. All of it completely driven by corporation. And, you know, 10 years ago, if you would have told people in this country, guess what? We're going to reach this certain year where you're not going to be allowed to work for the better part of a year. Kids won't go to school. Uh, people would have said you're high. But look. Here we are. And how did all this happen? And I would suggest the overreacher is demonstrable. And who knows? Maybe the silver lining will be the overreacher begins to diminish what corporation is allowed to get away with because things are just out of hand, man. The natural world is no longer recognized in any meaningful way. And I would suggest that for an upwardly mobile spiritual path of living men and women, you cannot marginalize the natural world, which is based in fact and perfect in its delivery. But that does bring the first hour of episode 243 to a close. Join us on the other side at crow777radio.com, C-R-R-O-W-777 radio.com. It is the only real Crow 777 site in the world, and there are frauds. And we're going to get into a whole bunch of things that we purposely had to push over to the second hour. At the end here, you can kind of see I'm tiptoeing on the fence, but I'm reasonably sure we'll get away with it. There it is, man. Join us on the other side. Cheers.
enemies of knowing.